Good afternoon. <clears throat> I am uh, Sakika Fukuda Parr, Professor of International Affairs here at the New School and one of the three uh, co-organizers of this conference. Um, thank you very much for coming back this afternoon. Uh, this panel is on um, uh, health and, um, and food and it will um, refer particularly to the intellectual property uh, provisions but, uh, of the agreements, but also more. Um, this morning already we heard a great deal about um, the um, intellectual property provisions as one of the uh, key issues and um, I, I think it was uh, Dean Baker who characterized uh, the, um, uh, the effects of uh, the increased prices of uh, patents. Uh, the, con the consequences of, of um, uh, price rises that you one might fee see from uh, harder patent terms as uh, basically a, um, a matter of net uh, welfare cost that should be set off against uh, any net welfare gains. Um, uh, we also um, heard about questions about the effects on uh, climate change and uh, technology. So today we have three um, uh, speakers who are all um, extremely knowledgeable about these uh, these issues. Uh, we have um, uh, Amy Kapczynski, who is professor of law at Yale Law School and faculty director of the Global Health and Justice Partnership. Her areas of research include information policy, intellectual property law, international law, and global health. Um, prior to coming to Yale, she taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and she was uh, also uh, she also served as a uh, as a as a law clerk to Justice Sandra, Sandra Day O'Connor and Stephen Breyer at the U U.S. Supreme Court, and also to um, Judge Guido Calabrese on the U.S. Court of Appeals Cir Second Circuit. Uh, she is best known, however, as uh, Amy Amy of the Amy versus Goliath. And that is over the battle uh, over the access to HIV retrovirus in South Africa, where 4.7 million people were HIV positive in 2001. And as an undergraduate, she led this campaign at Yale, started it, which led uh, to Yale and Bristol Myers Squibb pledging not to enforce patents on, for, on uh, D4T, uh, the, or the AIDS drug, uh, Zerit, uh, in that country. Um, so she is a noted uh, activist scholar in this field. Um, Tim Weiss is Director of Research and Policy Program at the Global Development Environment Institute of uh, Tufts University and leads Globalization and Sustainable Development Program at that institute. Um, he has a background, a long history of work in international development and specializes particularly in agricultural policy and rural development. Um, uh, he has written widely in this area, um, including uh, confronting globalization, economic integration, and popular resistance in Mexico, uh, and numerous other documents. Um, William New is a, um, is a journalist uh, who has been reporting uh, on the forefront of most major international uh, intellectual property and te technology policy developments uh, for over a decade. Uh, he's the director of Intellectual Property Watch, which is, uh, for anybody who is not familiar with it, the, uh, the most important sort of go-to place for anybody who wants to follow uh, uh, the developments uh, in uh, intellectual property. Um, he is... Uh, uh, has, uh, in that sense, uh, closely tracked free trade negotiations at bilateral, regional, and international uh, levels. Um, and um, he is uh, a well-known authority who has made, uh, who has appeared on television and radio, including a, a CNBC, National Public Radio, and so on. Um, so we are going to follow a slightly different format in this panel as uh, from the other panels we had this morning. Uh, we will start with an opening, uh, a shorter opening presentation from each of the three panelists, 
and then there will be a moderated uh, conversation before we open up to uh, questions uh, and answers from uh, uh, with the audience. So I'd like to first give the floor to Amy. Thank you so much. Um, I've learned a lot from this event and um, really grateful for the chance to come here and talk about an issue that I've been working on for a very long time. So as Kikiko, Sakiko mentioned, I worked on this as a student and I thought a good place to start, um, since not everyone is an expert in these issues in this room, would be where I came into these issues. So I didn't really come to trade law, I feel like trade law came to me. Um, I was a young um, student and actually my first job out of college, um, one of them was working for an AIDS organization. I cared about global health and what I was doing at that job was um, writing reports about for our members, I lived in London at the time, we had all these AIDS organizations that were members, and I was writing reports for them about what was going on for a in, with respect to HIV AIDS in the world. This was in 1999. And the picture in 1999 was that in the rich countries and in London, we had these new drugs, which came about in 1996, and they were starting to transform people's lives. We were running seminars about how to go back to work. Right? Because suddenly AIDS was no longer a deadly disease, it was a disease that was a chronic illness that could be managed with medicines. But in the rest of the world, right, in places like South Africa, no one was getting access to these medicines. And so I was writing about it, and that was the moment when I learned that the medicines were expensive, not because they were sophisticated and expensive to make, which was, I think, a little bit how we thought about it at the time. These were miracle drugs. They must have been expensive because of all that science. Right? They were expensive because it turned out of patents. Right? So these drugs that were being sold in the United States and in Europe, and actually in many developing countries as well, for ten or $15,000 a year, and these are drugs you have to take for your whole life, um, actually cost, we later learned and we now know, $100 to make. Right? If you sold them in a competitive market, they would cost $100. Why can't you sell them in a competitive market? Well, that's where patents come in. Right? And so what we learned as activists, because we wanted to get HIV AIDS medicines to people who needed them um, to survive, was that we had to take on this issue of intellectual property. And taking on patents and giving governments the tools that they needed to be able to say, okay, well, this is a real health concern, we need to be able to override patents. Just like when the government says we build a railroad and we need, we need to be able to take this land for public use, we'll compensate you, but we need to take this issue on. It's a serious matter of public concern. To do that, you need to do, you, and this starts to get technical, right? You need to be able to do things like um, issue a compulsory license, override a patent, you know, you give some compensation to the company, but then that lets you use these generic drugs. We wanted countries to do that, to bring the prices of the drugs down. And one of the things we also then came to realize was that we now had to take on the, the system of global trade and the agreements that are part of the international trade system. Why is that? Because when the WTO was created, for the first time, it brought intellectual property into trade agreements. And you have to sign on to the intellectual property components of these agreements if you're going to be part of this trade system, right? Is that because IP has anything to do with trade? Well, no, for the reasons that those of you who were here for Dean Baker's talk, you know, you could talk about IP um, and patents as a protectionist sort of tool, um, but they were stuck into the trade regime largely at the behest of big multinational companies who wanted to build and enforce these rights around the world. Right? So. Um, so for the last 15 years, I've been trying to work on questions, for example, like how can countries make use of flexibility within these agreements that will let them do things like bring generic drugs to people um, to improve their health. And it is an incredibly frustrating work, in part because, as you can imagine, um, some countries are interested, some countries have governments maybe some, what, like our own, they're complicated, they're not always interested in, um, in either risk or um, taking on uh, things that are the best for the public's health. Um, but um, the other thing that's been enormously frustrating is that in agreement after agreement that's happened since we have started this work and since we knew that the implications of strong intellectual property provisions in these agreements were deadly for people around the world, we get worse and worse provisions in these agreements and the TPP really is the worst of them all. So one of the things that I'll talk about is a little bit, and I don't want to get too technical, about some of what's in the TPP around these intellectual property provisions and the way that um, it, that can affect medicines prices. But I'll also talk about two other issues that are very important components of the TPP. 
um, I've had to expand beyond intellectual property because if you care about health, you have to look at many parts of these agreements. Um, so one thing I'll talk about is there's something called the, a pricing annex, a transparency. It's called the transparency annex. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that because it could also have implications for drug pricing. And I'll talk a little bit about the ISDS, the investor state dispute settlement process that allows foreign investors and only foreign investors to challenge domestic regulation and law um, where it affects their profitability. Because all of these have potential implications for health and beyond for access for, for price of medicines, but also beyond. So let me just say that although I came to these issues as somebody particularly mobilized around AIDS issues and, and access to medicines in developing countries, that I was also very much um, and am very much interested in health issues in the United States, the things in this agreement are issues for all of us because every country that's a signatory has to follow these rules and because some of those rules could increase medicine prices here and also constrain regulators here. Okay, so briefly, um, this is just a slide to give you a visual about the implication of patents. So now I'll talk about the intellectual property and the patents provisions. Patents are just a kind of intellectual property. So this is a slide that MSF, Doctors Without Borders, created to show the difference in price. So if you look on the, the, um, the, the gray dot at the start, that's where we started with AIDS medicine, it costing $10,000. This is where we are today, in part because when the generics come in, the originators lower their price, right? So around the world today, you can now get um, in many places, these drugs for as low as less than $100 instead of $10,000, right? That's the stakes of what we're talking about here. Can countries take advantage of that? If so, how many hoops do they have to jump through um, to be able to do that? Okay, so what is in the TPP then with respect to intellectual property? Um, okay, so one of the things that's in the TPP is an intellectual property chapter. It's 77 pages long. There's a lot in it. Um, but some of the key things that are in it, I think just the, the simplest way to think about it is that they reflect the interest of those who are at the table, which is basically on this stuff, almost exclusively the pharmaceutical industry. And um, those, the provisions that came out of it they are, I will say, a lot less bad than what we saw in the drafts. And that's because of tremendous advocacy that's happened around this issue along the way. But they're still more restrictive than a lot of what else is out there in the international trade regime. So, for example, um, you heard mentioned earlier this, this issue of biologic exclusivity. What the hell does that mean? Biologics are a kind of drug. They're usually sort of more sophisticated drugs that are made in a way that's um, a little bit different. So patents are often not such a big deal in these areas. It, they can be. But it's a, just a different kind of monopoly, right? It's, it's like nobody else can make these biologic drugs, um, say newer, more sophisticated, bigger molecule drugs, um, if you have this kind of exclusivity. And so the TPP requires us to have, depending on how you read it, five to eight years of, of exclusivity for these drugs, which is to say monopoly for these drugs. Every country that's a member has to have that. And it's just deliberately vague. Is it five years? Is it, is it eight years, right? Um, and, um, and that's interesting for us, I think, in the United States. So one of the things that I, um, I like to use as an illustration of how weird U.S. policy is on these issues is that the Obama, in the United States, we already give 12 years of exclusivity for biologics, right? Um, that was a kind of a, a decision we made in our national law. Of course, if we put provisions into international law, we are supposed to adhere to those, and so it constrains what we can do. The Obama administration, for five years in its budget, said we want to roll back to seven years of exclusivity for these biologic molecules. It'll save us $4 billion over the course of a decade if we do that. And yet it was lobbying in the TPP for 12 years. The USTR was lobbying for 12 years, and what we got is like maybe eight. Right, which is more than what the Obama administration wants when you ask the health people and the budget people, what do you want to do, right? Um, so, so I think you know, that's a very small slice of an example, I think, of how both how these agreements get negotiated and what some of their stakes are for us. So there's provisions like that one, which are basically just layering on additional kinds of power for companies to set prices. Um, and, um, and they'll have, I think, the predictable implications for price and therefore for access. Um, and, and not only, again, around the world, but also here. If we sign these agreements, it's going to be a great argument. We don't always follow our international obligations, obviously. But it's a great argument in Congress that this violates one of our agreements. And so if you've got everything else also pushing in that direction, we're never going to be able to roll back some of the policy decisions that, you know, hello, drug pricing is an issue in the United States, right? And we shouldn't be locking in the system that we have now in international agreements that will make it harder for us to change. Okay, so um, 
so I won't, I'm happy in Q&A to talk about some more of the details, but I know that that maybe is, is hard to follow um, in a, a big audience like this. So, so let me leave that, leave aside the intellectual property chapter and move on. Um, so there's also this lovely thing called the transparency annex in the TPP. And it's essentially something that the, the pharmaceutical industry has pushed as a way to get more access to and control over the way that governments around the world set prices for drugs. So we are the only industrialized country that has no really significant system for regulating drug prices. So of course, it's a high priority for pharma to try to take apart those systems that do regulate drug prices elsewhere. Um, this was a very contentious part of the agreement. It's a lot less bad than it used to be, but it's still bad, right? And part of why it's bad is that if you look at these provisions, what they're all about essentially is getting companies to have more access to the processes by which reimbursement rates are set for their drugs, right? And pricing decisions are made for their drugs. And to have more chances to influence that process and to make it harder for governments that want to do that. Now, our government's having a conversation now about should we engage in more serious price control in the United States? Do we have to? to make make our budget sustainable. These kinds of things will be more complicated um, after the TPP than before. So let me, let me close and with just talking a little bit about the investor state dispute settlement part. So totally different chapter, the investment chapter of the TPP and its stakes for health. For me, this is actually the scariest chapter of all. Um, and that is for a couple of reasons. So one, the, the way to think about what this is, this uh, we use so many acronyms, right? This terrible acronym, ISDS. It's a system that allows one group only, right, foreign investors, a privileged system to come in and challenge state regulation. This is a huge deal because in most of international law, including at the WTO, it's states that have to bring challenges. So if you, you know, Pfizer, want the U.S to do your bidding, you still have to get the US to do your bidding, and you can't always. With ISDS, you can go straight into this arbitration system yourself as a company and challenge national law, national policy, national regulations. Companies are increasingly figuring out that they can do this, and they're doing it very aggressively. And part of what is so then worrying on top of this is how vague the standards are. So when they come into these um, tribunals, which are really private and hard to access, they're not court systems, you can't appeal from them to court systems, um, what can they argue? Well, they can argue, for example, that that doesn't give me fair and equitable treatment, right? Um, and it discriminates against me as a company. These are very vague terms, and they have been used to challenge an extraordinary array of laws at the national level, right? They, these kinds of provisions and treaties came from the idea that governments were just, they were nationalizing mines or they were expropriating things, right? But they reach much, much more than that now. So a couple of interesting examples, right? The minimum wage law challenged in Egypt under a, a provision like this in an investment treaty. Um, the tobacco policy of, to, of, of Australia, um, to Australia adopted a plain packaging law for tobacco as part of its tobacco control measures, was sued um, by a tobacco company for that, saying that it in fact violated um, both their intellectual property rights um, and also um, minimum standards of treatment required by this. So, so you get these special rights as an investor and um, now we don't know exactly how these very vague standards are gonna be interpreted. Um, there's many other examples, I don't know if Lori, others may talk about some of them, um, but I think the basic thing to to take home about these is because you have these vague standards of essentially sort of my profits are protected as a company. <laughs> um, and you have the possibility of challenges to all kinds of things that affect health. So yes, there's an exemption in the TPP for tobacco. You can't bring the exact case um, that would be brought that was brought against Australia. But why just tobacco? There's all kinds of other food labeling laws. There's all kinds of drug labeling laws. There's drug pricing issues. There's intellectual, all the intellectual property concerns that I talked to you about. You know, ISDS could give companies a venue to bring challenges to national laws about intellectual property as well. Intellectual property is a covered kind of property under the ISDS, right? So this, um, I think, is a very um, big space of in a sense, unknown and unknowable um, vulnerability for national governments um, at a time when I think we have a number of, of reasons to think that we need fundamental shifts to our own, um, uh, say, national policy on things like drug pricing, um, but also where we need to be able to have the flexibility to do things around, let's say, labeling of food and tobacco that otherwise might be harder to do after the agreement is passed. So I will stop there and turn it over to Sakiko.
Next, we'll hear from uh, Tim, Tim Wise. No, thank you. It's great to be here, and thanks for that opening presentation. I think the, um, the richness of the discussion and the questions and, uh, this morning, um, uh, I think, are a, uh, a vindication of the, uh, of the idea that of introducing a lot of topics and ideas and background and then opening things up to um, each other and to, and to you. Um, um, and in that regard, I'm, so I'm sort of asked to talk about food and, I mean, the topic is food and health and to, to look at food um, in particular. Uh, I'm, I'm actually taking the liberty with the um, support of my chair and fellow panelists to go a little bit off script of that. Um, because I don't want to just talk about food and just talk about it in the context of health, um, but more talk about agriculture and talk about it in the context of global trade, trade agreements, and, um, and in the context of international development more generally. International development isn't really part of the TTIP discussion for reasons that there are no developing countries in the TTIP, and it's not much a part of the TPP discussions because the developing countries um, in the TPP are um, are such a minority and have so such such limited um, negotiating power in those agreements, and they also have their own offensive interests in these negotiations. Um, but I, I really think agriculture um, should be on the agenda. It should be on our agenda. Um, it should be on this conference's agenda. Um, and it's really for the, for the reasons that um, Celso Amarin indicated this morning in his, in his intervention, um, which is just that it's, um, it's an absolutely critical part of the international development process. And the rules that are set in these international trade negotiations um, matter a lot to how some of those things play out. So it's not that I'm not going to talk about food after lunch. I will talk about food after lunch. Um, um, but what, what really drives the discussion within the TPP and the TTIP dis, um, um, debates, and, and rightly so, is food quality and safety. Um, in other words, when people say food and health, we're really talking about food quality and safety. And, and again, from my background working on international development, international agricultural development, particularly in, in lesser developed countries, um, those concerns are seen primarily as northern concerns, whereas agricultural development concerns are seen as developing country concerns. That said, the concerns about food and, and health in related to TTIP and TPP are absolutely critical and very much um, related to the kind of uh, downward harmonization of regulations that have been mentioned by many of the panelists um, already and that I think will will deepen that discussion um, going forward. This has vast implications for food and agriculture, but particularly for food safety and particularly in the case of Europe. Um, um, I'm really uh, upset that Frank Ackerman, my former colleague from Tufts and um, colleague in Boston, isn't able to speak on the next panel. For those of you, I, I would rec highly recommend his new paper, his new study of the, the value of precaution, where he really looks at what TTIP threatens to undermine um, in terms of Europe's precautionary policies and what that actually means. And because he's an economist, um, he actually um, finds ways to, to put value on those precautionary policies, which is never done, right? Never do uh, sort of the, the, the avoided costs of disease end up in any of the modeling that's done on these, um, on these, uh, on these sorts of agreements. Um, and you know, he finds quite clearly that um, precaution in Europe has, um, uh, that the undermining precaution in Europe will cost um, Europe more than the, the estimated value of the TPP to the, um, to the continent. So, um, so I highly recommend that study, and I'm, for, I'm really sad that he's not going to be here to go into those, into those details, but hopefully we can um, um, 
we can deepen that discussion. I mean, he outlined some, but then others have done a much, uh, a very detailed job outlining some of the other food safety concerns related to that undermining of precaution. Um, IATP has done some really good work on that. A whole range of organizations have worked on this. They're actually way too, I mean, you, you could talk for half an hour just about that. I'm not going to, um, but, but I mean, you're talking about weakening of pesticide reg regulations, right? Pesticides that are banned, atrazine is banned in Europe and it's allowed in the United States. There's a whole range of them that suddenly would become subject to, um, uh, subject to negotiation and potentially litigation. There's the opening uh, and speeding of, GM, of genetically modified food approvals. Um, they've taken a precautionary approach in Europe to GMOs. We have not at all in the United States. Um, uh, the, the biotech industry is desperate to get into Europe and this is the best way to do it at this point um, is through this agreement. Um, the forcing, uh, forcing the EU to allow food additives in meats, we again, we allow practices that Europe does not allow, um, reptopamine and rectopamine in pork and what, chlorine cleansing of chicken and, um, and growth hormones in, in beef are not allowed in, in Europe. That's what we export. That's what um, we're trying to break down barriers for. And so there are serious food safety concerns there. Um, and then just even just the issue of um, consumer labels, right? Um, I mean, the most recent example under another agreement was the, um, the, um, eliminate, the objection to the US um, country origin labeling for meats. Um, and that's now uh, been challenged under NAFTA. Um, this is a, these, these um, current agreements would put in place the exact same kinds of processes that could challenge um, consumer regulations. And again, we don't lead the league in consumer labeling regulations, Europe does. So it's really the, a challenge to Europe on their labeling regulations. But again, what I, uh, to keep it short and uh, to, to introduce what I, what I said at the beginning about trying to put this in a larger frame, we really have to look at agriculture in the global, mar in the global context. Because for small-scale farmers in developing countries, the most notable thing about TTIP, about TPP, and, the, and its predecessors like NAFTA is what's not included, and what's not included is agricultural subsidies, is discussion of the probably the most trade-distorting um, policy that the United States certainly um, follows in its agriculture. And, and, and it's nowhere on the table. So people don't really actually pay attention to that, but there is no subsidies, agricultural subsidies discussion, negotiation at all in any of these agreements. There wasn't in NAFTA, there wasn't, there's not in, in, in these at all. And, and, and Celsar Marine was right that partly that's because it lives at the WTO because it needs to be a multilateral uh, agreement. It's not, it's not a, you don't reduce your agricultural subsidies for our exports to Japan, you redu reduce them altogether. Um, but why does it matter? It matters because th what these agreements do is liberalize trade um, by reducing tariffs and quotas. And, and these are measures that the United States largely doesn't use, but a lot of countries do. Um, developing countries in particular use them, partly to protect their markets from exports coming in cheap from, from developed countries. So if you negotiate one side of the of the um, one part of the trade distortions, the, the tariff barriers, um, but you don't touch subsidies. The tariff barriers open things up to U.S. exports. That's a boon to U.S. agribusiness, obviously, and exporters. Um, but that also reduces the ability of foreign governments to um, protect their producers with countervailing duties. Um, and usually, these agreements result in the reduction of tariffs to zero. But it does so without touching the subsidy side of the, uh, of the discussion. And in the past, and again now, what that means is that these policies are contributing to the massive overproduction of crops, the, um, the pricing of crops at below the cost of production. Um, that's one definition of dumping in international um, 
uh, in, at the WTO. Um, and, and the partial occasional making up of some of those losses to producers with agricultural subsidies. Um, so think about what the U.S. gets when it gets an agreement that doesn't touch subsidies but knocks down other people's barriers and doesn't knock down ours because we don't really have any. What, it, what, it, what the U.S. gets is it gets to keep dumping commodities at below the cost of production while partners are required to let them in without any form of defense, right? Without any way to defend themselves from those low costs. In Mexico, what did that mean? It meant that U.S. corn flooded Mexican markets after NAFTA because the barriers were knocked down. Um, exports jumped more than 400 um, percent. Export prices were 19 percent below the cost of production, so that's dumped goods. Um, producer prices in Mexico fell 66 percent. So small farmers got slammed by these by these conditions with absolutely no no protection from the government. Um, in terms of tariffs. Um, other crops saw similar export increases from the U.S. under the agreement at similar dumping margins of 10 to up to 40 percent coming from the United States. So that's not news. Um, but why is that important to this panel to, um, uh, where we're talking about TPP and TTIP? First, it's because we're we are entering another period of dumping. Prices are low again. They're likely, they looks like they're likely to stay low after the food price spikes and a few years of very high prices. Everybody treated that like, oh, the end of, the end of low prices. It's not the end of low prices. We're back in the low price regime and that's gonna hurt small farmers. It means that the US and other large scale producers are once again going to be dumping products on developing countries. Um, and this will affect all importing countries. But more important, the TTIP and the, and the TPP are the main reason, the, I think, as Celso Marine said, the, way, the main reason the U.S. refused to negotiate in the WTO. The WTO is the one place where the principles of special and differentiated treatment that recognize that developing countries need different and less stringent liberalization schedules in order to develop. So it recognizes developing, need, developing country needs. TTIP, TPP, NAFTA, none of those recognize any of that. Um, and it, touch, it says you can't talk about agricultural liberalization without talking about subsidies. So it puts it in a package. That's why the U.S. walked. Um, I was in Nairobi and if I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody else was there for the WTO meetings, but it was just astonishing, the, US, the arrogance of the U.S. position walking in and basically saying, we're done. We're not going to talk. We don't, we don't care that the agenda is what it is. We're not going to discuss any of the things that, are, that the Doha development agenda mandates us to talk about because we're were finished, and the reason they were finished, and it was widely understood by all the negotiators, by everybody in Nairobi, and pretty much stated by, by the U.S. negotiator, Michael Froman, was we go elsewhere for our trade agreements. We go to the TPP and we go to TTIP. And we're gonna get those through, and those are going to become the new template for the WTO. Those are gonna write the framework within which the WTO has to operate. Um, and that is why I think it's really important to keep the WTO in, in this discussion, to keep agriculture in this discussion, and to keep the impacts on non-members of the TPP and the TTIP in this discussion, because they too are going to be affected when there is absolutely no venue in which you can talk about the most trade distorting agricultural supports that are out there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join in this conference and to follow um, two such learned uh, speakers, uh, really three, uh, whose work I regularly read and write about uh, on a regular basis. It's an incredibly timely debate, uh, this conference, for in the United States, as far as I can tell, there's a very active debate over trade. 
I'm William New, editor of Intellectual Property Watch, IP Watch, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, as you can hear, I'm, a, I'm an American journalist, um, and uh, I used to write for uh, Inside U.S. Trade and National Journal in Washington um, for years, but that was quite some time ago. There I covered trade issues, uh, including trade agreements, um, and uh, you know, had the great honor to uh, uh, bask in the glow of uh, great negotiators like uh, Celso Amorim back in the day. Um, I just wanted to address a few issues, um, uh, give a few thoughts now following uh, the two points on health and, tra and uh, food that they've made. Uh, and then I, I would like to take an opportunity maybe in the Q&A to delve a little more deeply into one issue that I'm going to talk about. Um, so governments have been vigorously negotiating trade agreements with other governments bilaterally and in groups for years. And these are usually uh, seen as a useful way to raise standards in other countries and open opportunities for our businesses, um, bringing cheaper goods and new jobs back home. You're familiar with the process. We've talked about it of uh, negotiating a trade agreement in Washington um, and getting it passed, where in recent years, the administrations have been given the authority to negotiate a deal um, in private and then bring the deal to Congress and for an up, and up or down vote um, a yes or no vote. And uh, I'm a little confused to hear from Sonia this morning um, from TWN about um, some members of Congress uh, suggesting, proposing changes to the TPP text, which has been signed, uh, which is I, I'd be interested to know under what authority they, they'd have the ability to make any changes at the national level at this point. Um, that would be of interest to other nations. Uh, and I think contrary to the fast track authority that, that they're operating under. But the reason Congress agrees to limit itself to a vote after the negotiation is, um, is over was to give comfort to other nations that it wouldn't go and pick apart uh, the finished treaty after it was all done. That implied Congress and the public it represents would be consulted regularly and included along the way uh, so that the resulting agreement would not come as a surprise and would theoretically be supportable any objections, most objections would come up uh, in back and forth sort of uh, before the final uh, comes to the, to the floor of, of the House and Senate, or the Senate. And it was understood that the administration would consider trading away certain parts of the economy, perhaps, um, some areas that are not as strong for us uh, in order to get new opportunities in others. Um, uh, so some members of Congress might not be happy about this, but they could usually be taken care of with, with promises of training for displaced workers and, and the like. Uh, I'm not sure that last part has worked, and I think we've heard a, a, some evidence to that effect uh, today. Um, it's worth saying at this point that Intellectual Property Watch uh, doesn't take a position on the issues that we cover. We're journalists, we're UN accredited media. Um, but we certainly do pay close attention and represent all sides, and just by doing so, uh, it sometimes comes across as, I guess you could say, balance. Um, so trade agreements are usually full of uh, useful and carefully crafted policies that ease restrictions, harmonize processes, and address regulatory questions. But since I've been covering trade agreements, the public has always been suspicious of whether their interests are being sufficiently included in the process, and I think they've made their point. People came out in huge numbers, uh, I think you heard reference to this morning, um, but it wasn't one of the uh, slides um, from uh, 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 Sonia's very interesting presentation, um, to protest the World Trade Organization negotiations in Seattle in 1999. Uh, I wish I could, if you Google Seattle WTO, uh, you'll see an amazing number of images uh, if you weren't actually there. Um, I was there, I remember the, uh, the streets filled with what I would say were ordinary soccer moms and their kids. Uh, marching in massive numbers, to, you know, as far and, and as well in the company of some rather vigorous activists who were a little more aggressive, perhaps, um, facing tear gas and riot police as they tried to tell governments not to forget about the importance of health, food, and, and other basic needs and quality of life. Seemed like a basic message to give to your negotiators. And uh, we, we all remember and we've heard reference to January 2012 when inter the internet went dark, essentially, when Google, Wikipedia, and others protested the potential harms to knowledge access they saw in the, in the two IP enforcement bills in Congress, the SOPA and the PIPA. Huge numbers hit the streets in Europe, as we heard. Uh, the bills were abandoned. Um, so I'm not anti-trade. I think it can be useful and beneficial. I, I like to think about uh, how I grew up around Salem, Massachusetts, and the museums and houses there are filled with the history of the great ship shipping trade at the turn of the 18th century uh, that opened the way to India and China and, and more. 
and Americans in this developing country at the time uh, were, could get for the first time things that they could never have known and, and they were able to sell their materials and goods that they had. Society generally benefited. We heard a lot of very useful and constructive discussion this morning about the difference between trade agreements and trade. Um, but a basic question that keeps coming up uh, is whether inexpensive goods, including food, are the quality of goods that we want and made in a way that we want because that's the tangible benefit we are offered from trade agreements, from free trade agreements. Europeans tend to be a little more cautious. We just heard a, a very good presentation, I think, from Tim on that uh, about, um, and, and our, our, they're more cautious about assuming that cheap and available is always good. They're highly protective of things like their food, healthcare, public education, and we're negotiating a trade agreement with them now, the TTIP, if, if we, as we've discussed. There was a, a discussion, I mean, a negotiation this week here in New York, very hard to even locate, let alone get any information about. I'm missing a, a press conference at the end of the negotiation today to be here, and I, maybe there would have been some information provided, but it's not very likely that they would have revealed very much. Um, but you could say maybe in that negotiation, some of those ideas from Europe will come in to, do I dare say, elevate US society on some of these aspects. Um, now, in, in an election year in the US, uh, the issue of trade is squarely on the table. Most candidates are skeptical. The TPP completed last year, expected to head for a vote. Uh, maybe, um, you know, in this um, administration, but it's facing resistance and um, I mean, if you look at the TPP, it's 12 countries, some of the biggest economies in the world, the US and Japan, and some very quite small uh, economies, a big range, 36% of world GDP, 25% of world trade, but the gap between large and small is, is immense, and you really have to look at the details of the agreement to see how they've bridged those gaps. And during the negotiations, um, negotiators that we know from developing countries who come to Geneva regularly hinted, suggested, or maybe even revealed uh, how much pressure they were under to give way on, on things that weren't in their country's interest. You can certainly follow that process um, by speaking to any negotiator who's been through this. Um, it's fascinating to see who's on which side of the TPP this time around. Last time we saw Google, Facebook, Twitter, I think we heard mentioned um, against the SOPA PIPA, for instance. That wasn't a trade agreement, but it was a, a bill on IP issues. Um, well, so let's say this time public interest groups are opposed. Public health advocates like Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, are ve as vehemently opposed to the TPP as anything I've ever seen them take on. And they're, they're very particular, <laughs> I would say. Um, they usually support what their position uh, is about. And they're taking it on on the grounds, as we've heard, uh, that it'll undermine public health in both rich and poor nations. I, I thought it was an interesting news story in the Boston Globe uh, um, last week, uh, where the company New Balance Shoes here in the US revealed that it switched sides on the TPP. Why? Because, well, first the Defense Department came to it and offered it a big contract to provide shoes to the, to the Defense Department. That's hundreds of thousands of uh, shoes. But uh, if they would just keep quiet and not oppose the TPP, they didn't even have to come out in favor of it. They just, just kind of look the other way and you'll get it. Yeah. But what happened is the Defense Department hasn't followed through on the deal. So the head of the New Balance Shoe Company, which you know, make, it was trying desperately to make the only sneaker 100% made in America because the Defense Department still has that policy of buying made in American footwear and they just hadn't included, hadn't included sneakers or running shoes in that category, but now they were going to do that. Um, as he said to, I think it was NPR in a later interview, I, we can't even get in the parking lot. They won't, the Defense Department won't talk to them. So now they've joined the opposition. You know, there's, now they're opposed to TPP. I don't know what that says about you know, that raises other kinds of questions. But a group called Fight for the Future, um, I'm not sure who they are exactly, is uh, saying that it's fighting this kind of corruption and opposing the TPP. So anyway, this time it, t it appears in the TPP case that Google, Facebook, Twitter, Uber, all those cool guys are now supporting the deal. And uh, so yesterday, and then yesterday, and this is kind of a new tack, maybe it's not that new, I've actually been told over lunch that it, it's been tried. 
But uh, a group of, I think it was about eight former U.S. defense secretaries issued a letter uh, support, you know, urging congressional leaders to support the TPP because, because, it, because trade brings prosperity, peace, closer ties, and, as, and quote, so that China does not write the trade rules of the 21st century. And this echoes a line of thinking from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, which makes the historical case for United States as a Pacific power. Um, and they, they make a pretty compelling case, but skepticism is very strong and, and with good reason. Um, so is the TPP a strategic negotiation or is it, and, and do we need to do citizens need to give up advantages and, and rights in order to support that kind of uh, Pacific power uh, move is perhaps a way of bringing those two points together. Um, so now concern has reached beyond the TPP and the, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with Europe, um, to an agreement that the U.S. has left out of. I didn't hear it mentioned this morning um, in the list of agreements, I guess, I think because it didn't involve the U.S., um, but this is called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, includes 16 Asian countries led by China and India, including several TPP countries like Australia and Japan, and again, secrecy and a move to higher intellectual property rules held by developed countries are being pushed and are, are at play. And so health advocates are worrying again in this case that it's going to undermine affordable generics from India and China who are the, the source of the majority of the world's generics, including here in the US. Uh, I don't know if people know when you go to CVS, you're probably, I believe, I've understood, I'm not an authority on that, um, that many of those generics might be produced in India as well. So um, yesterday I was sent a notice from a group, meanwhile, um, oh, sorry, I, I'm gonna throw in the concept of food security. I was reminded by, by Tim's remarks um, that, uh, that, well, now I'll leave that for later. So let's move on. Just uh, yesterday I was sent a notice from a, a US group um, that asked to help stop another corporate trade deal from passing, referring to, to the deal as more secretive than the TPP. And this was the group Credo, which is a, an alternative um, uh, phone company that you know doesn't support uh, you know spying on you, informs you if they're giving your data to the government, and things like that. Um, and uh, not bad for journalists, by the way. Uh, so this treaty, or uh, this agreement, I guess it is a treaty, the U.S.-China Bilateral Investment Treaty. I had not heard of this. I've heard about BITs regularly. Now, China and the U.S. are negotiating together. What does that mean for the Pacific power architecture? I'm not exactly sure. So, you know, these are interesting questions. Anyway, why are the U.S. presidential candidates and many others opposed to trade? There's politics. There's the ongoing complaints about economy. We've heard a lot of discussion about, you know, the anger and, and what might be compelling this. Uh, the, the, economy, the economic arguments could, you know, tie in with the perception of a bad trade-off of jobs for cheap goods and harm to the global environment. Uh, in exchange, but for those, those with concerns, it may also be, and I think we heard reference to this this morning, uh, it may also be that the recent agreements were done in insufficiently transparent ways, and the people who Congress represent, at least some of them, uh, have, I mean, some of the members of Congress, as they understand their representation, um, were not given a sense of ownership in the negotiations, and they think, and I think, I'm going to talk about why this might be the case, that these negotiations are tailored to a number of special interests that may or may not represent uh, the public interest. So that's what I wanted to take a moment to talk about. I'm going to come back later in the uh, discussion. Um, and that is uh, that IP Watch um, submitted a Freedom of Information Act request uh, with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, the negotiating office of the, the branch of the White House, um, that leads on trade negotiations in Washington um, to get some details about the TPP. We've submitted this a couple of years back and, um, you know, journalists can play an important role in trade negotiations by helping to tell, tell the world where things are heading uh, so that the population and, and others can, can be informed and participate in the process. And uh, so when I and other journalists set out to cover the TPP, we, we found an unprecedented level of secrecy made it nearly impossible to, to even be, write a basic story on. I mean, the, the Financial Times would, you know, we'd, we'd scrape together a story of, 
you know, based on almost nothing more than the meeting date and what the list of topics were going to be. That you just couldn't, you had nothing you could say. And um, so we, IP Watch decided to submit a FOIA request, um, like all journal like journalists do all the time. Um, and any good journalist has a few FOIA requests to their name, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, that, um, you know, to see what was going on, to see if we could get more information. And the U.S. Trade Representative's Office took a very long time in responding. When it did, the results it, it provided were, um, were so minimal that we couldn't accept it. Um, and so we, uh, I'm a fellow, I'm a visiting fellow at Yale Law School uh, at the Information Society Project. And uh, I began, work, began working with the Media Freedom and Information Clinic there. It's a program of the ISP and the Abrams Institute for Freedom of Expression. Uh, and um, we submitted a, a we, we submitted a lawsuit um, with, uh, against USTR to try to get some of these documents, to try to get more information about the TPP. And that uh, FOIA request was filed in March 2012. The case has been in court since December 2013. Um, and now my, uh, my details are a little rushed on where things are because we just got a document back. We just submitted a, a motion back last night, which I've been going through quickly overnight to try to make sure I have the latest information. But, just a quick highlight of it, and then I can revisit it in the, in the Q&A. Uh, we targeted U.S. positions and proposals, not those of foreign governments. We focused on a sample of draft texts, particular uh, chapters, including IP, e-commerce, and trade remedies. You know, how much do you, uh, the damages, or how much do you pay when you, when you win or lose. Um, we also targeted decision memoranda that we had learned about um, anecdotally, where internal decision making uh, within the government and um, uh, within USTR, and we targeted communications between USTR officials and members of the Industry Trade Advisory Committees, and this is the interesting part, I think. The ITACs, Industry Trade Advisory Committees, um, have members who are, uh, I believe, chosen by USTR, uh, anyway, authorized by them to advise them on negotiations, and they're almost entirely, as we saw from the Washington Post uh, article this morning, uh, industry um, made up of industry, very few NGOs or others make it onto these uh, lists. And in this case, um, in the TPP case, USDR had created a cleared advisors site, and specifically uh, so that we, it, we are sort of running out of okay, time. Could so you sort of specifically so that it could uh, share documents with those cleared advisors and get their feedback? So the only uh, question I'll leave you with for now, and then I'll go into this case uh, a little bit later, was. Um, you have to ask yourself if they're sharing document, and then they, the, the USDR announced to us that these were, this was a, a matter of national security, so we can't share the information through this FOIA request. And you had to ask yourself, what if you're sharing the information with foreign governments, <laughs> and not your own people? Anyway, I'll leave it there. So uh, we actually don't have very much, t as much time left as I had uh, thought we might have for a kind of a moderated discussion. But I will just ask one question that you might perhaps all, all discuss. Um, Tim made um, a, a really interesting uh, point uh, that hasn't been raised this morning, which, which is that there are off the table issues, uh, um, uh, notably agriculture and um, and he further uh, pointed out the, um, the the advantages of the WTO versus the um, uh, the TPP and T TTIP. So the, the point is that these um, the, the two these two nego uh, agreements and other um, bilateral regional free trade and investment agreements are being um, uh, considered to be um, blueprints for future uh, investment. Uh, future investment and free uh, uh, trade treaties to come. And so where does this leave the WTO and how do you, I mean, do you agree that, that this kind of is where things are going? And um, what is your you know, comment on, um, on this trend? So uh, maybe I could start with uh, Amy uh, and then um, the... Um, so I, I think I, I do also share the view that this is the, the trend has been, and it's been true for some time, moving outside of the WTO. It's too hard to get. Oh. 
off. Is it not on? It is on, but I think you just have to be closer. Yes, I think that the um, that the uh, this is part of a broader move that we've seen over many years, moving away from the WTO because it's too difficult to get consensus inside the WTO. On the other hand, I think there's also a history of moving back and forth, so that we should expect that what happens is that n agreements get made wherever countries that have the power to make them can make them, and then they move them back into or, I institutions that have a broader membership because you've already then gotten a whole group to agree. They won't oppose it because they've already signed on to these commitments, and so now you have a smaller group, you know, in the in the bigger forum to really fight with. So that's how, um, in part, how we got the TRIPS agreement in the WTO was that the U.S. did NAFTA and other side agreements with other countries, and then they sort of dealt with um, some of the obstacles in the smaller fora, and then they brought it to the bigger fora. So I don't think it's impossible to bring it back to bigger multilateral fora, but I think what we all anticipate is that the TPP itself, for example, will have more membership over time, so that um, it will grow itself, and, and some of the provisions will certainly be on the table, and they'll be the sort of starting point for countries like the United States in fora like the WTO, mm -hmm. insofar as discussions mm -hmm. really get going on mm -hmm. those issues. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I mean, seeing in Nairobi what what it meant that the the TPP and the TTIP were the template for tra for the U.S. strategy for trade agreements, and uh, I would say for the rich country template for trade agreements was was abundantly clear. The U.S. agenda was no, we won't negotiate on any of the development agendas on any of the de development issues. Um, no, no, forget about the discussions of special products designation for sensitive crops, forget about the discussion of uh, special safeguard mechanisms to protect against import surges, forget about discussions of public s uh, stock holding of uh, crops for food security purposes that India has been fighting. Um, off the table, we're not going to talk about them. What we're going to talk about is how we're going to bring new issues onto the table. And the new issues are the Singapore issues of old that were rejected, widely rejected, um, by the G20 and others. Um, um, back uh, 10 years ago, and the, and, uh, the agenda is very aggressive. We'll, they're back. We want them back or we're not going to talk about anything. And so that's what's going on in Geneva now is the explicit discussion of investment. Procurement, I think, is the first one that's going to be public procurement, and it's going to be a direct attack just like these agreements are on, um, on uh, public procurement as an unfair form of of competition, um, so it's a, it's a terrible agenda, um, for sure. So there's no question it's the template. But I mean, I do think, what everybody said to the very few of us, um, uh, U.S. NGO folks who were there, uh, um, was please, please, please defeat TPP, please defeat TPP. And what they said to the Europeans was, please defeat TTIP, because. If those go down, the negotiating um, uh, um, dynamic changes. Um, and that's what would force the U.S. back to the table in the way that Amy says. It, it seems to me that you know, much of this trend is very much against the interests of developing countries. But so where does that, I mean, are they negotiating? Uh, why are they signing on to these agreements then? <laughs> Any, any response to that? Well, no, Maybe I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a big discussion, but I think the, I, I mean, I think the, the you know, 10 years ago is a long time ago, right? Um, Brazil's changed a lot, China's changed a lot. Um, uh, Argent I mean, the, the middle income countries that were, were, the, were the, the, the backbone of the G20 alliance have changed a lot economically, and they are much more off, they have many more offensive interests now in international trade than they used to. So they had a lot of defensive interests before, now they have a lot more offensive interests. That makes the calculus a little bit more in line with developed countries than developing countries. So I think that political economy has changed. Mm -hmm. That may be gone for good, um, but but that doesn't mean that the development, the mm -hmm. developing, the development issues are mm -hmm. gone for good. Mm -hmm. William? Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I was just going to throw, I was just going to throw in there um, uh, that uh, WTO recognizing that there's less negotiating happening, although it did just complete a trade facilitation agreement, uh, which it, which is fairly more interesting than it sounds, in fact, um, and we need to look into it more. 
is uh, still puts itself forward as not only a sort of a, a place of research and data that's available to the world to, to use um, in a somewhat neutral form, presumably, but it's also still the only venue where all governments still show up and sit around the table. And you can still have a discussion, even if you can't come out with an agreement uh, in some way in a fully multilateral environment. So it still does serve that purpose, and I think it will continue to do so. I was just going to say one point on uh, the we have heard in the past year uh, through some negotiations about extending an exception to the trips for the least developed countries, which turned out to be a bigger fight than you would think uh, due to a couple of developed countries, uh, this one we're in being one of them, uh, taking a strong position on that, um, an unpopular uh, perhaps, but maybe pragmatic position, um, that uh, public health activists are actually sort of longing for the discussions to come back to the WTO which, you know, and even TRIPS. I mean, TRIPS almost looks good sometimes, uh, and the, the multilateral <laughs> venue compared to these bilateral agreements. Um, I think uh, we should uh, open the floor for uh, questions and um, answers. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes left, so. Um, yes, please. Bruce Rosen, I'm sort of wondering, since you, you you, this panel and the ones before have described things as basically a template for other approaches, and I'm wondering how much, say, domestic things, how much aid things. For example, Haiti, because of a series of disasters there, we imposed upon them our subsidized food, so they have been flipped from 80% ability to provide their own food to under 20%. Is, is that the perverse model? And I'm wondering also, should we be looking at what is happening in TISA and um, how the Canadian counterpart to TTIP, CETA, is doing how that is handled there? And how does this fit into the specific spectrum of health and food? I think we should take a few questions at a time. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, hi, thanks a lot for the excellent presentations. Uh, I was talking to my students last night about the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, they were very critical of them, by the way, but uh, nevertheless, you know, these are a set of sort of broad-based, ambitious goals with, uh, you know, sort of uh, promises to end poverty, to end hunger, to provide better access to medicines, etc. And it seems that there's, you know, that's, those discussions are happening on one track with many of the same countries that are now uh, negotiating the TPP and uh, TTIP also signing on to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah. And then on the other hand, we have this really stringent uh, and you know, potentially highly enforceable regime uh, that imposes these disciplines on these very countries that makes the achievement of these goals almost an impossibility. Uh, so how do we think about the links between these SDGs and uh, the treaties that are being uh, Negotiated right now, and if you, you know, if you sort of, if you say that, um, you know, there really are no uh, sort of exceptions for developmental objectives within uh, these treaties, then what does that say about the SDGs? And are they just a feel-good, legitimating exercise that we're sort of indulging in on the side uh, that really doesn't have any meaning? <laughs> yes. Uh. Susan. Uh, Susan, University of Connecticut. Um, my question is actually in a similar vein, only I'm asking if anybody has perhaps maybe Tim more evidence on the uh, damage that was done to food security as a result of NAFTA and hence projecting that if TPP were to be passed, would we have any way of estimating the number of people whose hunger would be increased? Uh, Mr. Amarim. And I don't know if I should speak because I will have my turn, but I, no, no, I no, pretend please go I ahead. Tend to speak yeah. about different things maybe. I mean, I don't know, for instance, the, the, the reply to that. Maybe someone knows, but I remember because when the NAFTA was being negotiated, it was more or less the time in which started the negotiation of the so-called free trade area of the Americas. One of the few proposals that didn't go forth because there was a big resistance. The resistance is the name of, of this panel here, not only by NGOs, but by governments in the region. Oh, unfortunately, the governments with this tendency are now apparently crumbling down, so I'm, I'm, I would not be surprised if a new effort for an FTAA would appear. But I would say at that time, 
uh, uh, one of the problems that was pointed out was the difficulty for the producers of corn, maize, in, in Mexico, because it was all small production and they could not uh, 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 face the competition of the very much subsidized American maize. So I think that was uh, maize. So that's one, one of the problems. I don't know the figures. On the SDGs, allow me to say that because I think since I have now the floor, well, you know, it's almost <laughs> as if there would be a schizophrenia of the countries. I mean, there is a, some places in which you uh, pay lip service or make concessions to idealism. Okay, you go to make the Millennium Goals, the Sustainable Goals, well, they don't like very much that you repeat, for instance, the flexibilities of the TRIPS agreement, but well, no, that's not enforceable. Okay, so when it comes to the real world, which is the world in which you have trade sanctions, uh -huh, forget about, oh, that was another forum, it doesn't, it's not valid here. That's the way people behave. I know that and I, I have lived through that as a, as a negotiator. But I, I want to make two points very quickly, uh, which I think are uh, relate to what was said before, and I may forget that when it comes to my turn. One is the, the link between the strategic vi vision and the f trade vision and the economic vision. And I was very, very much scared, actually. I didn't, I had missed that, that, that uh, declaration by one of the important candidates concerning that the TTIP or TTIP, as you say, uh, will be a new a kind of economic NATO. That's really very, very scaring because a NATO is a defensive agreement and of course prepared to, uh, to, to, to enforce its will and to counterattack and so on and so forth. So I, I hope it's, it was a, a lapsus lingui, as we say. I mean, it's not, not, not seriously meant. Uh, but I think there is a very important strategic tendency, which I think maybe is not being totally viewed. If you think of the WTO, for instance, and the origins, the GATT, that was a creation of the United States, basically, after the war, because it was a creation in order to reinforce, to strengthen the multilateral system as opposed to the fragmented system that existed before the war, including the Commonwealth, whatever, so on, uh, Europe, uh, and so forth. So now, what we are seeing is an opposite tendency, the tendency to strengthen a fragmented system, and why? Because, I mean, I'm speaking frankly, I'm no longer in government, I can say, well, the United States is the only remaining, the only remaining superpower still. So people tend to diminish the importance of that. But what they're trying to do in the economic sphere is more or less a kind of strategic hub and spoke. So you have an agreement with the, some Asian countries and isolate China, but the same importance is the FTAA. In, 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 in Latin America, not to isolate Brazil, because Brazil is not as important as China, but to avoid, to avoid or to make it more difficult for the integration of South America, which then might be a counterpoise for the United States. And the same thing will go for other uh, regions as well. And I'm, I'm, think, I'm, I'm extremely concerned, and I think this is what you just said is true, that probably what was obtained in these agreements in which either you're dealing with a similar partner in the case of TTIP, which we don't know if it will finish, but anyway, or with very weak partners, which was the case, uh, uh, basically the case in, the, in the, uh, the TPP, and was also the case in the negotiations that the United States had one by one with small or smaller, let me put it way, smaller Latin American countries. And that was the, the template that they wished to use for the whole thing. So I think these are the, 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 the main points that I would say. And, if I may just say a final word, that I think the WTO uh, uh, failed. I think there were several things, and of course there was some intransigence also in some part of other developing countries, I want to say. But the, main, the United States has an incredible leadership. Let us not forget that. And when the United States really wants, it can help. And I think this lack of strategic vision at a certain stage in 2008, when there was this big uh, uh, impasse, was the main reason. And why was that so? Because the, what had been negotiated so far implied an, a, diminu a substantive diminution of domestic support, which is the main form of support nowadays in the, uh, of, of, of for agriculture. That was the main reason why it failed. And I, I, was, I must say, it was very unfortunate that the Obama government, which did many important things like Cuba, Iran, and so on, very similar to the Brazilian foreign policy, by the way, but uh, 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 
that the Obama government did give any importance to the WTO. That was really one very bad tendency because this is a structural tendency which will be very difficult to change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, you have another, I have a, you have a question? Uh, well, if you wish. I mean, yeah. You have, you have a, you have. You're going to quickly address please. a question yeah. that you, I have. You're asking about uh, whether the Congress can still change the TPP oh, yeah, even yeah. though it's concluded. I was curious about um, that. I know and you're so, not an expert. Yes, on. even though there's fast track, we saw with the Korea US free trade agreement, even with fast track, they can reopen it. Yeah, they sorry. can reopen it if a majority of Congress says we will vote no unless you change it. Oh, and even they don't even have to go that far. And of course, they don't have the votes now, but they say they will get the votes if you give them this extra stuff. But they don't even have to go that far. They could do it through side letters, bilateral they, they side letters. They did this with CAFTA, didn't they? They've done side they, letters post conclusion yeah. with a number of US yeah. And FTAs. so they'd have to go back to the trading partners and yeah. present this, right? Yeah. And there's, there's, they, they apparently are kind of in the process of doing that now. Hmm. And so the, on the SDGs question, in addition to the unenforceable issue that um, Mr. Amorim raised is, of course, that um, the exceptions that I mentioned in the TPP for health and environment do not apply to the investment and intellectual property chapters because the rights of big pharma and foreign investors are more important than the health and the environment yeah. and people's lives. And in CETA, the question um, that was raised about CETA is that it's worse than the TPP and TISA in restrictions on ability to regulate services. The regulations have to be as simple as possible. So for example, no health impact assessments, no environmental impact assessments, no heritage impact assessments, and they have to be pre-established. So you can't change your licensing requirements for a nuclear power station in the light of new information or something. Um, and so CETA restricts the ability to regulate and, and TISA does too, as we mentioned. Thank you. So why don't we have a series of uh, responses to these questions here? Um, you want to go first? I, I'd love to. You've got the answers to a number of those questions uh, related to um, food security and all and others. So I'm not going to take those on. But I have a couple of things I wanted to hit um, that I hope address the questions, <laughs> because I didn't take as careful notes as you did on the questions. But let me just say these things. Um, one is if you uh, there was a. Um, Okay, forgive me if this isn't related to a question. I'm going to say this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> since, um, since today I think it is was. his birthday, in my mind it was. you can do yes, so. Yes, that's right, it's my birthday. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I get to, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, well, you know, journalists, we usually listen, so when we finally get a chance to give an opinion, it's, you know. Uh, anyway, so here's the thing. The, if you look at the chapter in the TPP on IP, you find, uh, you can find a couple of places where there's a kind of a, a, a deference to some of the things that developing, that the, you know, Chile's of the negotiation would have tried to get. Something that preserved a little sense of, you know, in the TRIPS agreement, you know, in the, in the global IP trade agreement out of the World Trade Organization TRIPS, there's an element in there called flexibilities, meaning, you know, with any patent, let's say, it's built in that it's not absolute in every case, or with a copyright, it doesn't always apply. A journalist or an academic or others, especially in the US with a copyright, can get an exception or a limitation use that. We're not gonna go into that whole discussion, but just to say there's these flexibilities for LDCs and even to any really country, but certainly any country that's not a major producer of pharmaceuticals, to be able to issue a compulsory license, meaning requiring you to give me, you know, that I can make that or get that drug made uh, without um, essentially observing the patent. It's built into a patent. Some people see it as breaking the patent or an exception to the patent. In another way of looking at it is, it is part of the contract of a patent, part of the agreement. Anyway, the TPP chapter uh, restates the TRIPS and Public Health Agreement out of 2001, um, but, but it, takes a little twist, it, and, and I'm just giving this as an example to say, here's where developing countries got a, a reference to the TRIPS and Public Health Agreement, which was an, an, a kind of an, an additional statement to the TRIPS Agreement that came a little bit later that reinforced the right for developing countries to use flexibilities. Um, it, it states that, you know, it, it essentially recognizes the TRIPS and Public Health Agreement, but it, it, it says that it it, it emphasizes that the exceptions can be, it never mentions flexibilities, and that the exceptions can be used in emergency and, and crisis situations. Mm -hmm. And that has been a huge debate in Geneva about whether, because in TRIPS it says, you can, do, you can take an exception to patents uh, for public health reasons if you, for sovereign 
purposes. If you're a nation who has a public health situation and you wish to do so, it doesn't have to be an emergency or a crisis. It can be that you've chosen it. In, in, in TPP, it sort of reduces it down to an emergency or a crisis, which is much more limiting. It doesn't explicitly do it, but it, it hedges it. it, it trims it. And same with the public domain. Um, it's very chintzy language. It just acknowledges the importance of it. Um, copyright, it, it does similar things on the limitations and exceptions. It, uh, countries are con confined to special cases. It doesn't extend the reduce or reduce the scope, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't really um, give you an action that you can take uh, and reinforce your ability to take action. It, it's just sort of very minimal. So all I was going to say there is developing countries, uh, if you look at the language that resulted and if you could get the earlier versions and especially be able to identify who had put forward what proposals along the way, um, you could figure out how much of this language reflects the exact language of industry in the United States or maybe developed country uh, industry uh, together, but typically U.S., in this negotiation. And our FOIA request, which I'm going to try to talk about in the next question, <laughs> um, because I have a couple of interesting points to make there, and one very breaking point that just came out this week, um, show how close industry's involvement is in this activity. So I just want to leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, we have to, I know, we I have such that. a short of, uh, amount of time. So uh, Amy, you want to go next? I guess um, there were many questions there. I wanted to just maybe speak to one and in some sense to reemphasize what others have stressed, but about the Millennium Development Goals, right? So there is an incoherence between the goals being elaborated by some institutions within the international system and then what's going on in the trade arena. Just want to stress that that's by design in some sense, right? And that different institutions are given jurisdiction over different kinds of issues. And the institutions that are given jurisdiction over sort of development, human rights, and then of course those develop their own communities around them who have expertise in those issues are not given the same powers that the institutions that have jurisdiction over trade are given. And of course here we've talked in many different moments about the enforceability of the trade agreement versus the enforceability of other kinds of agreements. I just want to stress for those of you who are um, Americans in this audience, and US citizens um, or voters, you know, our own system parallels that. So if you create a human rights treaty in the United States, you don't get a fast track. There's no fast track for human rights treaties. There's only fast track for trade deals, right? So it's much harder to get the US to sign on to a human rights agreement. You have to go through, do you, get, do you have to go through the treaty clause of the Constitution, which is two thirds of the Senate, right? Then to get something a trade agreement through because that has the fast track process associated with it, right? So, so there's these built-in aspects of the system, which if you like are kind of an expression of the neoliberal construction of global governance today that don't make it in a sense surprising and make it pretty hard to undo um, the kind of conflicts that we're talking about. Oh, just briefly wanted to say something, Sikiko asked, so why do countries sign on to these agreements? I think it's a really deep and important question. Very complicated, and of course, one part of the story is that many countries fight like hell to improve the agreements in their own national interests. And so, you know, Peru fought a lot of these provisions in the F, uh, in the TPP, for example. So there are there's a lot of good work being done. Um, but I think the other way to think about it is, well, why is the U.S. signing on to these agreements? We've heard a lot of accounts about why it's not in our own national interest, right? It's in the interest of some, uh, some people or some companies in the U.S. And I think we have to, in a way, stop talking about these agreements as so simply about you know, country X versus country Y and start thinking about them as themselves the product of a fight uh, between interests within countries. And that these agreements are an expression of, if you like, sort of the 1% uh, around the world. And that exists in all countries have an elite that has some interests in some of what is done in these agreements that makes it easier for uh, these agreements to prevail, even if they are against the interests of the country, quote unquote, at, at large. And I think that's whatever explanation you can come up with for why we sign these agreements if they're not in our national interests, like just project that out into the world. And then imagine places that are in fact even have far less access to some of the democratic tools that, you know, Williams described, we don't even have great access to in our own societies. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Um, and, and I was going to say that, you know, we've been talking around the issue that I don't know we've named, but it's, you know, it's called asymmetric bargaining power and it comes from asymmetric economic and political power relations and you know it's when you put a uh, government like Mexico's in the same room with the government like the US and tell them to negotiate and one economy is a hundred times larger than the other and and has a lot more um, 
power. So that, that's one piece of it, and that's why the WTO was so important, because it, allow, it allowed developing countries to group themselves together and negotiate as groups, and you never see that in these regional trade agreements, which is a shame, right? I mean, you think about it, it's like, do we see um, Chile, Peru, Malaysia, and Vietnam presenting themselves as a block of developing countries in the TPP? No, not at all. It's not even considered, but that became the norm in the WTO negotiations, and that was addressing somewhat that a asymmetrical bargaining power. But the why do people sign? Why do countries sign? I think Amy's right on target with that, and I think it really has to do with the rise of, of multinational corporate power globally, right? It's not just in the U.S., it's certainly in the U.S., but it's also broader than that. And so the poorest countries sign on because they're desperate for capital, and this is the condition for capital coming to their countries. The countries that have um, somewhat more developed economies sign on because the multinational interests within those societies have developed much more power relative to the other interests in those countries so that, you know, the, they take, take up policies that actually go against the interests of some of their national producers, some of their really large national producers. They create international competition for them. Um, and they're doing, and so that contest of power happens within those countries, it happens in the United States, but multinationals are winning those battles. And I think that's why we see these, these deals. I mean, just to go to the, some of the specific questions, but to do it really quickly, so maybe we get in one more round. Are you hoping for one more no, round? No, I, I don't You're think You're giving we, up. We have, we have four more minutes, so we have. Oh, okay, well, I'll run out the <laughs> clock then. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I guess I wanted to say, that in, in, in response to Susan's question about um, damage from NAFTA and documentation. I mean, I actually think, I think the campaigns in uh, against TPP in particular have done a very good job in the United States of pulling out the lessons from other trade agreements, whether that be on trade deficits and the rising trade deficits, agricultural trade deficits from those agreements, um, uh, sort of all of the, the social um, and environmental impacts from those agreements. I think we've done a pretty good job of that, and NAFTA is sort of everybody's go-to template for it in a way, because it's the one that's been in place the longest, and it's the one that um, has been uh, more clearly documented. In Mexico, I mean, you can pick a zillion different indicators. My favorite indicator of the failure of NAFTA is that before NAFTA, 53% of Mexico's economically active population was in the informal sector, and now 57% of Mexico's population is in the informal sector. This is in a, people say about NAFTA that it is, no country will ever have as many advantages as Mexico had in, in the moment it signed NAFTA. China wasn't in the WTO up yet, it was actually an exclusive marketing access agreement to the biggest economy in the world at a time when that economy was experiencing the most rapid economic and extended economic expansion in its history a country with which you share a 2,000 mile border and have established trading relations. And even with all of that, you get all the investment and you get the increase in trade, you get exactly what you wanted and you end up with 57% of your people in the, in the informal sector. It's like, what is that? Uh, poverty levels are still high. And, and that 57%, by the way, does not count all the people who left, all the people who migrated to the US which is exactly where you'd go because that's where the jobs were created by NAFTA in the informal sector in the United States. So again, I think the, there's a zillion indicators on NAFTA. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we are really out of time. So <laughs> um, William, who has been uh, on the sort of the, in the, 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 the battles in the forefront of this, uh, just has one tidbit of information to share. I mean, I think what we're seeing is this asymmetric bargaining power is also asymmetric um, negotiating power. It's also asymmetric implementation power. So, you know, when someone mentioned the SDGs, the implementation of the uh, SDGs will be basically captured by the same, uh, same power 
asymmetries. Anyway, so uh, uh, you, uh, William, you can read your last tidbit. Uh, Thank you. Tidbit. Sorry. Just so, want to so get this I would on also record say here. Um, you, you can uh, read his writings. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, I mean, these are in stories in IP Watch, and there's one coming out next week on, on more. Uh, but um, when we did press harder on the FOIA request, uh, we got about 400 pages of emails between USCR and the uh, industry advisors. Almost everything was, was redacted, was blacked out, but some of it was left in. And um, just, I, know, I only get to read you one line of an example from a, chemistry, a chemical company lobbyist uh, who said he had just seen the text on rules of origin and he remarked, someone owes USTR a royalty payment. These are our rules. This is a very pleasant surprise. Oh. <laughs> and it, it's filled with stuff like that. We have stories that have written about it. And then the second point was, um, we just received this week uh, from the chief negotiators for TPP, pretty interesting descriptions of, I mean, in response to our case, um, pretty interesting descriptions of their thinking about what's, what went on. And I'm just reading this one line from one of them, I won't name them right here, uh, but a, a key negotiator on the IP chapter uh, said disclosure of the, he's saying why they shouldn't disclose the records uh, that we've asked for. Disclosure of the records identified in paragraph three would expose a snapshot of a negotiating partner's positions that could subject that government to unwarranted assertions that it failed to address a specific constituency's goals by offering either excessive concessions or not demanding sufficient concessions from others. Uh, oh, I, I didn't read the right sentence, and I don't get a second one, but just to say, the next sentence says basically, this could lead to defeat of the treaty back in those countries. You know, in other words, if, if their countries find out what they were saying, they might actually object. Isn't, isn't that what we've been talking about all day? And then the final point was this one. Um, this is perhaps the most alarming. This is actually groundbreaking. In this case, I'm a little, uh, I'm not happy to say that our case may be leading to this happening, but the USTR had indicated that its communications with industry might be protected under interagency, you know, inter when agencies communicate, it is protected. And they'd indicated that under that, communications with its industry advisors might also be part of the interagency protection, which of course can't be true because those are industry, not interagency. But this time, they've now come forward to say that they have declared the industry proposals made to cleared advisors must be protected not only for their own business confidential reasons, but for national security reasons. It, this is the first time that a, a pack of top Yale lawyers can find in history that the US government has said it must protect its communications with the top industry officials under national security uh, you know, rules. They're using this national security protection for just about anything. So we're, we're responding to that. And these communications are with the Recording Industry of America, Pharma, and others. It's putting them as classified communications at this point. Just wanted to make sure to bring that up. Thank you. For the thank you very much. So thank you. Thanks to the three panelists for a wonderful uh, set of comments. Thank you.